And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness, in some translations you'll read, all the fullness of the Godhead dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And we'll stop there. He is the head of the church. This is why I have so much research, so much uh, written down on my notes throughout my study of the week. I have so much because this issue has been with us since the very beginning. It has marked seismic shifts in the history of the church. And as much as we might think that it is something that has been put to rest, it continues to be an issue for us today. And in fact, I'm convinced all of these will never be fully rectified till Christ come and return and take, uh, take his bride by the hand. And then there won't be anybody who dares to try to stain her. But who is the head of the church? He is the head of the church. I mean, we have it right here in Scripture. I could, I could quite literally stop the sermon here and just say, he is the head of the church. Amen. But it warrants a little more than that. Head of the church is an idea that's uh, it's somewhat unique to Paul. It's introduced here and in Ephesians, which I have mentioned before is a very close parallel letter. Ephesus was only about 100 miles up the road from Colossae. So a lot of the things that we, you'll see echoes in Colossians, maybe they're, they're further explained when he writes later to the Ephesians, but this idea, head of the church, now, Paul is likely here, as we've already established, he's likely quoting an early Christian hymn, so this metaphor may not even be his. He may be finding it in the lyrics of this, uh, of this poem, but it, it's an apt metaphor, and, and let's get this right out of the way. When I say that I'm the head of something in our modern sense, you may think I'm the chief executive of something, I'm the CEO of something, right? I'm the head of a corporation, I'm the, the head of the hospital, I'm the, the head of a governmental ministry. That's half of what we're talking about here. When we look at the Greek manuscripts, this word is kephale, it is head, it is quite literally head, the physical head of a physical body. That's right. So, Jesus is saying, or rather, Paul is saying, Jesus is, yes, chief executive, we might say. He is chief executive of the church. But he's also using this metaphor to say, if the church is a body, then he is its head. Rather, he is the controlling organ of it. He's the brain. He's the seat of reason, we could say. So, just to, to get that away, when we use this word, we're not saying that he's just, uh, he's not the, the CEO. He is quite literally the head. If he's not there, the whole thing dies. The whole thing can't function. It can't get up and walk around. And this makes it an apt metaphor. A very apt metaphor, that Christ is the head of the church. He's the sole controller of the church. And by church, we're not just talking here. Here, we're talking about the local gathering. Again, this, is, this works on several levels. He's the head of the church. Well, you, Paul is saying, yes, you and Colossae, he, Christ is your head. He's the head of your specific local church, just as Christ is the head of this Liberty Baptist, this specific local church. But this also has a larger meaning lurking underneath that he is the head of the church universal. Every church, every true faithful church, every true faithful gathering of, the, of, the, of believers, whether it's here, whether it's in the Philippines, whether it's in Africa, whether it's, whether it's on the moon, it doesn't matter where it would be. Every true and faithful gathering of the church has Christ as its head. And if it doesn't, it is there by re therefore by reason not a true and faithful church. He's the head of the local church. He's the head of the church universal. He's not just the, the head of the Colossian church. He's the head of our church. He's the head of all the church. And it, it definitely answers, this, this metaphor definitely answers the question, whose church is it? Of course, those of us who know our scripture know that even before the crucifixion, Jesus turned to Peter, giving him that great con, um, that great commendment. Right? You are Peter. You are a rock. And upon 
this confession, the confession that Peter had just given, you are, Christ, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, he said, upon that I will build my church. It's Christ's church. Again, I could stop here. I could give you, he is the head of the church, and I could back it up with another piece of scripture and just say amen. I, in one sense, it's, it's amazing. It's almost stupefying that, as one theologian has said, a very prominent preacher and theologian, that this doctrine has sailed down to us on a sea of blood. It seems to be a no-brainer. And yet, it has been fought over and argued over century after century. Throughout the history of Christianity, this truth has perhaps been the cause of more martyrdom than any other. Sailed down to us on a sea of blood indeed. Now, in its simplest form, this truth can actually be summed up in three words. Uh, Two words if you're fluent in Greek. And it can be summed up in this. Jesus is Lord. Amen. That's it. That is the whole confirmation. But we need to break that down. What exactly do we mean by that? That is probably one of the shortest, earliest Christian creeds. I know we tend to get a little tense in the shoulder when we throw around the word creed. It simply means what we believe in. What do we believe? We believe that Jesus is Lord. Now, what makes this so inflammatory, this simple affirmation? Well, it puts Christians at odds with the world. Always has, still does, always will. Let me tell you this. In Rome, in the, uh, the Greco-Roman situation in which the Colossians, in which all the early church found itself, under Rome, everyone living under the, uh, under the eagle had to swear allegiance to Caesar, at least once a year, they had to go to one of the temples in Caesar's name and burn incense there, and they had to basically swear an oath, of a, take a pledge of allegiance, and the pledge of allegiance was simply this, Caesar is Lord, meaning Caesar is my Lord, meaning I defer to Caesar in all things, that as far as my life is concerned, I am Caesar's slave, I do what he says, and this caused a problem for Christians. So it's a very deep and very unique problem for Christians. Because in antiquity, I've written here, the, the term Lord was not just a courtesy title for your social superior. Its root meaning means ruler. Who rules over me? To say that someone was your Lord means that you swore fealty to that person. When they said jump, you said how high. However, however, Upon their confession of faith and their baptism, Christians put themselves under the lordship of Christ. And therefore, when it came time for them to go to the temple and offer their incense and say, Caesar is Lord, that is a real conflict of conscience, and rightly so. They are Christ's douloi, Christ's slaves, Christ's servants. Christ is their Lord. They take their marching orders from him. To then go and say, Caesar is Lord, either in place or alongside of, is in fact to create a monster with two heads. And they wouldn't do it. Under penalty of death, they wouldn't do it. And so they died. They died by the score. The Romans executed them for failure to recognize the lordship of Caesar. And amongst the earliest and perhaps most famous examples of this is an early church martyr. If you don't know his name, you will by the time I'm done, because you should know him. Polycarp was his name. Polycarp. Polycarp uh, was, according to most sources, a direct disciple of the Apostle John. So we know that later in his life, John went to Ephesus. He went to Ephesus, not far from Colossae. He was actually a bishop of Ephesus, and amongst the men he discipled to be amongst that second, that new generation of Christians, was this man named Polycarp. Can you imagine that? Imagine being trained, being under the direct tutelage of the apostle whom Jesus loved. Well, Polycarp lived to be a ripe old age. He was um, 86, maybe 87, and he was arrested this very thing, for refusing to burn incense in honor of Caesar. Now, on account of his great age, when he was brought before the Roman magistrates, they they kept giving him extra opportunities to recant. They said, will you just say Caesar is Lord, old man? I really don't want to have to do this. And he refused time and time again. 
And actually, we have this quote from him. Now, this is in the year 166 or 167. This quote is almost two millennia old, but listen to what Polycarp finally said. Quote, Eighty and six years I have served him, capital H, served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? You threaten me with a fire that burns for a season, and after a little while is quenched. But you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked, close quote. And they burned him at the stake. They burned him at the stake, and they pierced his side because he refused to acknowledge Caesar either in place of his Lord or alongside of his Lord. Now, Paul wrote to the Colossians, as we said, in order to strengthen them so that their worship might remain pure. In, we, we could also say in order that their doctrine remains true, in order that their fealty remains where it has already been placed. This is a church that has already said, Christ is Lord. They've said it corporately. They've said it personally. Christ is my Lord. He is Lord over not only me, but my brothers and sisters here as we gather. Not only as we gather, but as we live our lives, he is Lord. And Paul says, you've got that right. Keep going. Don't be dissuaded by that. The issue of Christ's lordship, as we've said, has been with us, always will be, always has been. So this morning I would like to look at three things. I'd like to kind of approach it backwards, if we may. I'd like to approach it backwards. What are, I'm going to give you three things that are not the head of the church. It's a good three-point classic sermon. Uh, if my wife were here, she, would, she loves these. She says they're very easy. And if you're making notes... I'll give you the three points. Here are three things that are not the head of the church. The Pope. Amen. That's a good Protestant. Yeah, right there, yes. The Pope, the Crown, and the Pastor. All right? The Pope, the Crown, and the Pastor. And I'm a little nervous about that last one, but let's get to that. Not the Pope, all right? One of the key issues in the Reformation was exactly this. Whose church is it? Who gets to call the shots? Who gets to dictate how it is run? Who says how it is organized? Who says who's included in it? Who says what it believes? And of course, by the early 1500s, this was well cemented in Western Europe, Eastern Europe. This was the Pope, the so-called Vicar of Christ, the head of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, with regard to salvation, I'm going to quote you canon law so that I cannot be accused this morning of just Catholic bashing. I'm actually going to give you their own words. This is canon law. Quote, We declare, say, define, and pronounce that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Pope. Close quote. 1512 and 1517 saw a council. It was called the, uh, the Fifth Laturian Council. And out of that came this quote. Quote, where the necessity of salvation is concerned, all the faithful of Christ must be subject to the Pope. Close quote. More recently, in the words of the Vatican Council, I'll give you a slightly longer quote. Quote, if anyone shall say that the Roman pontiff has the office merely of inspection and direction and not a full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the universal church, not only in things which belong to faith and morals, but also in those which relate to the discipline and government of the church spread through the world, or assert that he possesses merely the principal part and not all the fullness of this supreme power, or that his power which he enjoys is not ordinary and immediate, both over each and all of the churches and over each and all of the pastors and each and all of the faithful, if you don't say and affirm all of that, what happens? Quote, let him be damned. Close quote. Let him be anathema is the word. So if you say that the Pope is not the head of the church universal, anathema is pronounced on you. And by the early 1500s, faithful men of God said enough is enough. Now amongst them was a man named Jan Hus. You're going to learn a lot of new names. you learned Polycarp. Now I want you to learn about Jan Hus. He was a, uh, a forerunner to the, to the Reformation by about a century. He was um, located in kind of Eastern Europe, and he preached and argued from reform. He was, a, he, was a, he was a priest. He was a priest in the Catholic Church who had come to see that the thing he loved, the thing he served, was just rife with corrupt, corruption. 
So he preached on three points, these three radical points that would eventually lead to his death. And what were those three points? Well, one, that the Bible is the sole authority on all church matters. Shocking, right? To which the bishops and higher-ups in the church said, uh, Jan, could you please stop preaching on that? He said, no. His second point that he wouldn't stop preaching on was that the church includes all believers, all believers. This is contrary to what was, at least at the time, the doctrine that the church is the pope and the bishops. And you, sitting out there in the pews, you are not the church. You get to come in contact with the church during the Eucharist. But other than that, you are on the outside and we're on the in. And he said, that is absolutely not true. We are a priesthood of all believers. Therefore, the church is all the faithful. Amen. Another event. Oh, boy, I like having you in the front row. And of course, once again, they said, Mr. Huss, Jan, Jan, could you please stop preaching that? No. But that wasn't, that wasn't actually what got him killed. What got him killed was this third, po third point. That Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church, not the Pope. And they burned him as a heretic for that. And when he was facing his death, as they started piling, piling the wood around, he said this, quote, What I have taught with my lips, I now seal with my blood. Close quote. About a century later, Martin Luther is struggling with the same thing, the thing that he loved, the church he served, rife with corruption, its dress stained, came across the writings of Jan Hus, dusty and stashed away in a basement of a monastery. And he was amazed that someone has finally, in his eyes, addressed all the things he's been struggling with. And based on that, Martin Luther, of course, became one of our chief reformers, and he responded to the issue of papal headship with this, quote, listen to these words, quote, I am persuaded that if at this time St. Peter in person should preach all the doctrines of Holy Scripture and only deny the Pope's authority, power, and primacy, and say that the Pope is not the head of the church, that they would cause him to be hanged. Yes, if Christ himself was again on earth and should preach that the Pope is not the head of the church, that he is, they would crucify him again, close quote. Jonathan Edwards, centuries later, I mean, the great American theologian, he followed with this, quote, King Jesus is the head of the church. Those who are in his kingdom of grace all acknowledge the same king, the same rightful sovereign, and are willing to be subjected to him, submit to his will, and yield obedience to his commands, close quote. But of course, if you've been here for the past year, you know that one of my heroes of the past is Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, and in his way, I'm going to give you this, it's a bit of a lengthy quote, but whew, 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 I, I wish, I wish I could string words together as this man. Spurgeon said, quote, of all the dreams that ever deluded men, and of all the blasphemies that were ever uttered, there has never been one which is more absurd than the idea that the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, is the head of the Church of Jesus Christ. No, these popes die. And how could the church live if its head were dead? The true head, capitalized, the true head ever lives, and the church lives in him. And then he goes on to say, It is awful blasphemy for any man on earth to call himself Christ's vicar and the head of the church. It is a user of patient of the crown rights of, of King Jesus, for the true church of Jesus Christ can have no head but Jesus Christ himself. I am thankful that there is no head to the church of which I am part, save Christ himself, nor dare I be a member of any church which would have to contend to have any headship of his, close quote. Now you say, that's amazing. But surely this is an issue that's been put to rest. Surely Surely we don't have to deal with this anymore, do we, Braden? Surely the Pope no longer claims this kind of authority or this kind of title. Hasn't this issue been put behind us? Well, I'll tell you this. The doctrine of papal infallibility was set in stone as recently as 1870. What is the doctrine of papal infallibility? That when in the exercise, quote, when in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, 
he, that is the Pope, defines a doctrine, when he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church, that he is preserved from the possibility of error. If the Pope says it, it's infallible. Now, what are our, what are our Sunday school children? Remind me again what our Sunday school children are just going out to learn about. Oh, right, it's the infallibility of Scripture. There's only one infallible thing in all this world, and it's God's word. It's not whatever the Pope says, whether he writes it on a document or speaks it as he's flying in front of the press from one place to another. Let me give you this quote from Ludwig Ott, who is a 20th century Catholic theologian. Quote, a true power, a universal power, a supreme power, a full power is possessed by any Pope who can thereby rule independently on any matter without the consent of anyone else. He himself is judged by no one because there is no higher judge on earth than he, close quote. That's in the 20th century. That man died in the late 80s. Now currently, if pressed about this, a Catholic will tell you the Pope is the head of the visible church. This is what they've started doing recently. They've started splitting hairs. Well, yeah, the Christ is the head of the church, yes, but the Pope is the head of the earthly church, they'll say. He's the head of the visible church. And that lets them, as they say, acknowledge Christ as head of the, the spiritual church, the, the heavenly church. And I guess it's nice that they include him in there somewhere. However... I guess I would strongly encourage everyone in Rome to look at the passage that we are down in and at the verses that we have just looked at, mainly 116. All things were created by him, all things in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible. Oh dear, Christ is head of the whole church, whether it is visible or invisible, whether it is in heaven or on the earth. Because he created all things by him and through him and for him. And that includes the church in every aspect. Even though we are currently alive and running around on the physical world, at the same time we know from scripture our citizenship is in heaven. We in fact, as true faithful believers, straddle both realms. We're in the world but not of the world. We're here but our hope is stashed in heaven. There's no making this kind of division that Jesus gets to run this particular department, the Pope gets to run this other department over here. There's no departments, they're one and the same, and Christ is the head over the whole thing. So the Pope is not, in summation, the head of the church. Now, at least you think I'm Catholic bashing, let me move on to my second one. The crown is not the head of the church, and that by mean the government is not the head of the church, right? Now this too is an issue that goes back to the very beginnings of our church history, and this too is an issue that continues today. Let me give you, again, well, you're getting all kinds of church history, aren't you? Let's talk about Constantine, the Roman Emperor Constantine. He reigned from 306 to 337, and you need to know him because he was the Roman Emperor who made Christianity the official state religion. It was no longer outlawed, people were no longer persecuted for being Christians, and in fact, once the ball got rolling under Constantinian rule, everyone born a citizen was also a Christian. That's where we start to get things like child baptism. Constantine and the Roman emperors that would follow him, with, uh, with, there were a few exceptions, a few guys who tried to make Rome great again and roll back the clock, but on the whole, they took on the role as the promoters and defenders of Christianity. The reign of Constantine established a precedent for the position of the Christian emperor as head of the church. Emperors considered themselves uh, responsible to the gods and for the spiritual health of their subjects. And after Constantine, they had a duty to help the church define and maintain orthodoxy. The emperor's role was to, um, to enforce doctrine, to root out heresy, and to uphold ecclesiastical unity. And this title, uh, Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor, you'll see it throughout the Middle Ages, get passed down into the German kingdoms and the Eastern Roman Empire. As the power of the papacy grew during the Middle Ages, the Pope and naturally came into conflict with the, the Holy Roman Emperors. That brings us to the start of the English Reformation under King Henry VIII. Now, I'm sure as you remember from your school history lessons, Henry VIII, he had a problem. He had a problem. His wife, Catherine of Aragorn, she wasn't giving him a son. He really wanted a male heir to continue his lineage. And so after 
trying and failing and trying and failing, he decided to do what any loving, caring husband would do. He decided to divorce her, get himself a new wife. He uh, had also been um, enamored with one of his wife's servants, thought maybe she would give him a son. So he, he sought a divorce. He sought a divorce. And the problem was the Pope refused to grant such a thing, would not let him divorce his wife, and so King Henry divorced the Pope. And thus was born the Church of England, or as you may know it today, the Anglican Church. This is how it got started. And Henry VIII declared himself to be its head and required every household in the kingdom to swear an oath that he, not the Pope, was the head of the church. They exchanged one boss for another. They had to swear that the king, rather than the Pope, was the head of the church. Those who refused were hanged. Then they were drawn and quartered. So, if you don't know what that is, they were hanged, but not until they were entirely dead, and then they were taken down. They were actually, their limbs were tied to four different horses, and they were pulled in four different directions. That's what you get if you don't espouse the king as head of the church. Now, oddly enough, only a decade previously, all right, a decade before he, he, he pulled all this, in 1521, Henry had personally repudiated the arguments of Martin Luther. When Martin Luther went and nailed his 95 theses to the door at Wittenberg, as a good Catholic, Henry VIII decried him. And in fact, so loudly and so, uh, so well that the Pope rewarded Henry with the title of Fide Defensor, Defender of the Faith, which is still incorporated in the titles of all the monarchs to this very day. And then, of course, 10 years later, he divorced the Pope. So, fickle, fickle man, I guess, Henry was. Now, not everyone was uh, overjoyed with Henry VIII's declaration that he was the head of the church. And by the time that his daughter Elizabeth took the throne, she actually changed this title to Supreme Governor. I am the Supreme Governor of the church. It's, it's rather in the same camp as saying, I, I run things in the temporal realm while acknowledging that Jesus is the, the Lord and head of not just the spiritual realm, but the spiritual affairs, but I still, get to, I still get to dictate policy in there. Supreme Governor. And again, this is a title that is in use by our current sovereign. Queen Elizabeth, amongst all her titles, is Defender of the Faith and Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Now, following the rule of the Puritans in England, here's your, I'm just flying through British history, right? Charles I comes to the crown, we have a Puritan revolution, we get rid of the monarchy, his son Charles II flees to France. For a while we have a, basically a dictatorship in England, but also men are finally free to worship as they will. Years later, his son Charles II comes back, we have an event called the Reformation. And during the Reformation, the restoration of the monarchy under Charles II, we have one of my favorite events in all of church history. This is the Great Ejection of 1662. If you haven't heard of it, I, I am overjoyed to acquaint you with it. The Great Ejection of 1662. So here's what it was. So Charles II comes back, he comes, he takes his throne, and he says, we got to do something about these Puritans. we got to do something about these dissenters, including early Baptists, who are running around and dare these Baptists say that the local church has an autonomy that it's actually governed by its own members in what's something called congregational government. Well, that can't stand. And so on August 22nd, 1662, an act of the parliament went into effect, and that was called the Act of Uniformity. Now, this was, this was preceded by a piece of legislature in 1661 called the Corporation Act. Basically, what these, these were laws. These were laws that came out of the parliament and they restricted the holding of office, of public office, solely to members of the Church of England to start with. So you couldn't be mayor unless you were a member of the Church of England. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't be a member of parliament. You couldn't go and represent your community in the government unless you were a member of the Church of England. And then on top of that, they added the Act of Uniformity. And the Act of Uniformity contained specific guidelines for the public prayers and the administration of the sacraments, most notably... Most notably, it required every minister in the land to use and follow the liturgy as laid out in the Book of Common Prayer. It meant that every Sunday, every single church service around the land looked the same. They followed the same layout 
as laid out in the Book of Common Prayer. They prayed the same prayers, and in fact, in some instances, what they got to preach on was ordained for them and handed to them. And this act was scheduled to start on October 24th, October 24th, 1662. And anyone who refused to comply by that date would, in terms of their ministerial office, they would be treated as dead. So the Sunday before this went, in, went into effect, the Sunday before the deadline, which came to be known as Farewell Sunday, more than 2,000, 2,000 plus Presbyterian, Baptist, and independent preachers and ministers went into their pulpits and said goodbye because they were about to be ejected by the government from their pulpit and their congregations. They went in and preached goodbye. Now, I've researched this. I have um, a man named Stoughton. He wrote a history of religion in England, and he describes this. He says, quote, For many hundreds of ministers on the same day to be uttering farewells is an unparalleled circumstance. And he describes some of them, quote, Assembled crowds of aisles, standing places, and stairs filled to suffocation, people clinging to open windows like swarms of bees, overflowing throngs in churchyards and streets, deep silence, stifled sobs as the flock gazed upon the shepherd, sorrowing most of all that they should see his face no more. Close quote. Tensions ran high throughout the land that day. The they were actually so, the government was so fearful that riots were going to break out that armed soldiers were placed in the streets of London. One such man, deprived of all his spiritual promotions, was named Matthew Mead. And three years later, three years after being ejected from his pulpit, he wrote this. He described the great ejection as this. This quote, this fateful day deserves to be wrote in black letters in England's calendar. Grant this, oh my God, for your son Jesus Christ's sake, I implore thee, close quote. Writ in black ink, huge, dark, immovable, permanent letters. Let this date forever be emblazoned on England's history in shame. Why? Because it was on this date that the government pronounced itself the head of the church. And if you didn't tow our line, you don't get to be in the church. Now, many continue to preach anyway. Undeterred, they continued to preach whenever, wherever they could. They started meeting in homes. They said, fine, I'm not allowed to preach in church. I'll just have, I'll just have the church over. I'll have the church over and we'll have a house meeting. We'll have a house meeting. And that's how they got around it for about a year until they passed, uh, they passed the Conventicle Act of 1664, which made religious assemblies of more than five people, other than an immediate family, they made that illegal. And the punishments varied from a five dollar, sorry, a five pound uh, fee. Worse yet, if you were caught illegally worshiping or preaching, if it was your third offense, you actually faced transportation, quote, to any of his majesty's plantations beyond the sea, to Virginia, to Canada, to the Americas, for a period of up to five years, unless you could pay the astronomical fine of a hundred pounds. A hundred pounds for preaching or worshiping illegally. Why? Because the government, the crown, said it was the head of the church and could therefore dictate how you do church and who's in it. John Bunyan, we should know his name, author of The Pilgrim's Progress, yes, spent 12 years in prison after being ejected from his pulpit. Missed the birth of his children. He was arrested for, uh, quote, several unlawful meetings and conventicles to the great disturbance and distraction of the good subjects of this kingdom, close quote. Baptists, uh, just as a side note, Baptists took particular pains to hide their meetings. We're clever. I think we've always been clever. We're, we're a sneaky people. We, we don't care. Who says we can't? It just encourages us to can. <laughs> All the more. I have this. Um, Baptists, so they started meeting secretly, and uh, I have this from a historian, they usually avoided singing because it might call attention to their meetings, and they often set a lookout. And quite often the congregation, if they had warning, would send their minister through a trap door into a concealed basement or out an upstairs window where he would cross over the roof to an adjoining house and escape. And often Baptists would arrange to meet in an upstairs room, 
right? They'd meet in an upstairs room, and then they would pack the stairway with women and children to impede the approach of the authorities. <laughs> we read of a few times when the lookouts, the lookouts hearing the preaching, became so convinced of their own sin and need of salvation that tears obstructed their vision, and they actually failed to sound the alarm in time. Can you imagine if we had to post a guard outside the door? Can you imagine if we had to keep the back door unlocked in case the police pulled up? Can you imagine living in such a, such a state? No, of course you can't. Praise God you can't. Because we have the freedom here to worship. No one is coming down and saying, the prime minister is the head of the church, the lieutenant governor is the head of the church. Not for us. Just one final act on the great ejection. So they, they said, you can't preach in your churches. They said, fine, we'll preach in our homes. They said, you can't preach in your homes. They said, fine, we'll preach wherever we can. And finally, in 1665, they enacted something called, uh, more popularly, it came to be known as the Five Mile Act. And it simply said this. It was the final coffin nail for many of these ministers. The Five Mile Act forbade clergymen from living within five miles of the parish from which they had been expelled. And upon their deaths, they were not even allowed to be buried in their own churchyards. They were absolutely and totally cut off. And that's why if you go to, like a, if you go to a very old European city like London, you'll find a graveyard seemingly in the middle of a residential neighborhood. That graveyard used to be five miles outside of town away from a church, and that was as close as that faithful minister could be buried to his flock. The city's just grown around it. They would not acknowledge the crown as the head of the church. I need to get going on my third point, but I'll just say that during that same period uh, in Scotland, from 1625 to 1675, the English massacred over 400 pastors for the same reason. They wouldn't acknowledge the king as being the head of the church. In 1888, we have a a Scottish historian, he wrote, uh, his name, his last name was Blakey, and he wrote a, a book called The Preachers of Scotland, and I'll, I'll give you this quote before we move on. He, he describes this period in Scotland. He just says this, quote, By the force of reaction, the church was thrown upon the more full assertion of Christ's claims as the head of the church and the glorious privilege of the church to follow her head. The more the truth was thought of, the more glorious did it seem. He says, in effect, all this persecution did was reinforce this conviction. The harder they came down, the more they believed, the more they espoused. Now again, you say, Braden, this is not an issue for us. You say, this is not an issue for us here in 21st century Canada. Really? Really? Let me remind you of 2018 when the Trudeau Liberals, who are currently in the party in power, announced a small but significant change to the application form of the Canada Summer Jobs Grant Program in which all applicants were now required to attest that their workplace or organization's core mandate fully respected the individual human rights of Canadians, including their right not to be discriminated against on the basis of sex, religion, race, ethnic origin, or sexual orientation. Also included in that attestation, almost hidden in that list, were the words, reproductive rights. Reproductive rights. In short, if Canadian employers, and this included churches, who like to hire students over the summer for various ministries, if Canadian employers wanted to be eligible for the government's money, then they, like the liberal MPs before them, had to become pro-choice advocates. They had to, let's say this, they had to swear an oath of allegiance to the, to the, to the right of abortion. Or you don't get the money. You want the money? you got to follow us. We get to dictate policy. And this presents a problem for faith-based organizations such as, such as us, such as the Christian church, to those who believe in the God-given, sacrosanct nature of life, but also need a little financial help from the government in order to hire four students to run their vacation Bible school. So what do you do? Well, last year, particularly in our home church in Whitby, I said, don't take them. That's blood money. That's blood money. Don't you dare take it. You take the stand. I say, thank you. No, we will get along fine. 
However, the church in that instance also needs to understand that there's a cost to taking that stand. And that is, if you don't take the government's money, it then falls upon the rest of the congregation to give out of their bounty to make up the, the fall. There is a cost, is what I'm trying to say. There is a cost to upholding this faithful doctrine. The Pope is not the head of the church, all right? The crown is not the head of the church. The pastor is not the head of the church, right? The pastor is not the head of the church. What do you want about here, Braden? Again, this is something that has followed us all throughout our church history. The, um, mid, uh, the early 4th century, the Bishop of Constantinople was a man named John Chrysostom, a very dynamic speech, speaker, cried out against the excesses of the rich. He was actually exiled to the Black Sea twice. Uh, amazing stories about him. He became something of a celebrity in that he was so faithful to the word, he was so unafraid to call out the culture in which he had been installed. People just actually packed the church just to hear this guy. He became something of a celebrity. Throughout all of the church history, there have been celebrity names, there have been names among preachers and church leaders that just have been elevated or have been catapulted above the rest. You think of names like Whitfield, Edwards, Spurgeon, Moody, even uh, more recent names, Billy Graham. So this is not a new thing, this issue of the pastor becoming the head of the church. But what is new, what is the, one of the dangers that lurks outside the doors of the contemporary Canadian church is this idea and then this number of celebrity pastors and the speed at which they are being created. We live in an era, an entertainment information era that facilitates the rise of pastors who are absolutely unqualified to be running a church and yet have enormous followings. I could give you a slew of names, mostly because after a, they're, on the, they're on the far side of their parabolic curve. A lot of them have, over the past several decades and through the seeker-sensitive movement, they have planted churches that have swelled to enormous numbers that have actually incorporated a model I find detestable, the multi-campus, the multi-site church, wherein you might be getting, you're a, you're a satellite of, a, say, a church that's in Toronto, and you'd worship here, but when it came time to, be the, to receive the message, it wouldn't be me standing here, it wouldn't be me that's, you know, a pastor that's in your immediate community, a screen would come down, and live via satellite, you would receive it from your head pastor, who's not even a member of your community. The satellite model, it's a terrible thing, and I pray that God will smash it down as quick as possible, because it is not the biblical model of how you build a church. If you have 14,000 members in a church and they're spread out over a wide geographical location, you find godly, faithful men within your local congregation and the congregation elevates them to the position of elders to, to facilitate the preaching and teaching of God's word. Sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent there. But let, me, let, me give you, let me give you what Paul tells Timothy, right? Pastors are to be temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome and not a lover of money. Then none of these things are particularly compatible with the hubris that accompanies our current slew of celebrity pastors. And this is the other thing. These churches are always independent and never connected to any kind of denominational framework. And that means that is just one less level of checks and balances. It only enables someone to come up and give you garbage doctrine from the pulpit. It doesn't have to agree with any kind of denominational statement or anything like that. Celebrity pastors. When a pastor resigns, all right, when a pastor resigns and then you see the whole church collapse, that's because that pastor was the head of that church. It was built on him. It was built on him. Because if that church was properly foundation on Christ, who lives now and forever, it doesn't matter who comes in this place, it doesn't matter who goes or where he goes or even the circumstances under which he goes, the church endures because its head lives and its head is uncorruptible. What is it that qualifies Christ to be the head of the church? It's easy to say, Christ is the head of the church. What is it that makes him qualified and disqualifies everybody else? Because he was the firstborn from the dead. The 
firstborn from the dead, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness of the Godhead should dwell. And it was Christ who made peace through the blood of his cross and reconciled all things to the Father through himself, whether they are on earth or in heaven. Those are his qualifications right there, right there, 18, 19, and 20 are the qualifications for Christ to be head of the church. So let me say this. When a government official or a pastor or even a pope reconciles all of mankind to God the Father through his sacrificial death on the cross after leading a perfect life, then he can be the head of the church. Or he can at least apply for the job. And unfortunately, that position is currently filled. Christ is the head of the church. We need to know this. We need to believe it. We need to hang on to it. We need to espouse it. Because not only has this been an issue all throughout our history, as I hope I've showed you, just even, even briefly, but it's an issue that continues to dog us in different ways, but continues to dog us even to this day. And so the reason that Paul wrote to the Colossians is the same reason I preached this to you this morning to remember who it was that purchased you. To remember who it was who suffered and died for you. Remember who it was who lived a perfect, blameless life when you could not possibly, and I include myself in this as well, who lived a perfect, blameless life so that we, through faith in him, could be free from the punishment that we rightly deserve for our sins. Remember the one who gifts you his righteousness. It's not the Pope. It's not the Queen. It's not even me. It's Christ. 